Well, good morning. I am so grateful for today's message. You know, we just finished a, a multi-month study looking at the book of 1 Peter, and I hope that you haven't stopped chewing on the truths that you heard as we studied that book. But today is a different kind of day. Uh, there are times where we need to pause and we need to reflect. And honestly, I think that we have multiple reasons for our gathering. And one of those reasons we come is to learn more about God through His Word. And we're going to do some of that today, but not in the way we've been doing through First Peter. Uh, secondly, we come to be challenged by God, and I hope every time that we come, we're challenged that His Spirit stirs in us to things that He's calling us to. But today is a day of celebration. I think this is an important part of remembering that we have an active God who loves us and an active God who is working in us and through us. And so we're going to celebrate today God. That is my hope. And I hope you leave encouraged, uh, excited about the movement of God. Also, just awakened to the reality that God is active. He is not passive. He is not sitting back silent. And He is ready to be celebrated and to be glorified. So let's open up to Psalm 96. We're just going to look at the first three verses to set the stage for our message today. And so it starts here, it says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. We're just going to use that to set our hearts and minds on this idea. We're going to sing the praises of God today. We may have already sung literal songs in in our gathering but we're going to sing the praises by clapping by in our minds, by cheering for God's amazing, steadfast faithfulness in our lives. And so I want to make sure we understand this. Today, we are looking at all of God's marvelous works. We are going to celebrate his marvelous works. And so I want to start with a foundational truth that we're going to carry on through our first point today, and that is that God is in control. And I want to encourage you to take notes with me. Uh, write things that God leads you to consider. Maybe it's names of people I'm going to share. Maybe it's a, something that stirs in your heart that he's calling you to as a result of what I'm going to share with you today. But I want to start that God is in control. And I have got a lot of amazing stories I want to share. We're going to start just with a trip this year to celebrate a Mexico team that you were a part of sending and praying over and many of you participated in. A reminder that every year we've been doing this for 20 plus years, and we've taken hundreds of people to serve in Mexico to further the gospel. And this year, 51 people went on a journey, and uh, your blessing over them was financial provision and prayer and and support of supplies, and so we want to say thank you, but I want to let you know a few comments that came from those who participated. Remember, the theme right now is that God is in control, and this was the picture you're looking at right now is the picture of the team that served in the background is this very humble, what you might call a storage shed, and it was a house that was built for a widowed Uh, a widowed mother and her widowed daughter and five children. And what an opportunity when you partner with the local church to go and build a home. They were living in uh, basically what looks like an igloo made out of uh, scraps of plastic. That was their home. And as a part of you sending, we got to be a blessing to her as she is being blessed by the local church through the team that was there. And it was such a great opportunity to remember that uh, our widows, Our orphan kids, those who are in need, it was an opportunity to partner with the local church. And uh, I want to read to you a few comments. As people served, I didn't grab everybody's. That would take the entire, I don't know, two or three hours of comments. But I wanted to share some key comments to elevate God being in control. I want you to just listen to the heart of people. And you can look at that picture while I'm reading. Just, Just listen to the hearts. It says, I saw God bring unity. I've never experienced a team who did everything as one. Although we came from many different places and different families, I saw God bring all 51 of us together in one big family. We actually had people from San Diego all the way to to Salem, Oregon that that came together as part of this team and and a couple of churches and all the way down I-5. So we're just grateful. 
The second statement was, I think in church, when we attended church in Mexico, when we were speaking Spanish and English together in worship, it didn't matter. Our language uh, didn't matter. The color of our skin didn't matter. We were one. It was truly so amazing. I don't think you can tell someone about it to get the full impact. It was a had-to-be-there time, like what it may be like in heaven. And I believe that is a picture that God is in control to bring the nations together to be one. And what a cool opportunity. Another couple comments is, is how much can be accomplished in a short amount of time when God is leading and we are obedient? They were surprised at how much we were able to accomplish, not only in the projects uh, like working on this building, but just in the, the fellowship of coming together, preparing meals, preparing for crafts, preparing to go and do other serving projects. Last one I'll finish with from our Mexico team said this, I met a 33-year-old woman that was in a nursing home because she had a brain tumor and it left her blind and she had a stroke and that caused her left side to be immobile. I couldn't speak to her because of the language barrier, but we prayed for her and I was able to massage her arm and her arm released and she was able to stretch it out more completely than in the beginning. And I could hear her and see the relief on her face. I felt God's presence very close. I want us to celebrate the reminder that everybody on this team went down with a purpose or a plan in mind. And often what they found is they weren't doing anything they thought they were going to. They didn't know perhaps that they would be the one building the building project or be the one massaging the arm. Uh, they didn't know they might be the one who's giving instruction to some kids who are missionary kids living there. It may, they may not know that they were going to be cooking cookies at 10 o'clock at night. But I want you to know that God is in control. And I have a story of the proof in my life. I've seen this happen more times than I can count. But I want to celebrate God's faithfulness and him being in control at a time when I thought there was nothing we could do. And so this is a picture of a tent. That's just a modest tent used at a wedding. And uh, there's Pastor Daniel, uh, a friend of mine who's leading a church that's in, in the, the beginning phases of, of developing a community there. And I remember it was Monday, the week of our departure to Mexico, and I got this message on Facebook in the morning. So I was talking with Daniel, and, and we were just about to finish, and he says, I don't know if your church would be able to provide a tent, but uh, we, we really need shade. Until we get a building, it's really hot. Um, do you think that's something that we could consider? And I said, you know, to be honest, I'm just about to head out of town. In fact, I'm coming your way. I'm going to see you in a few days. And there's just a lot on my plate right now, but I'll, I'll, let's just pray and see what God might do. And so we closed up our morning time and I headed off to work. And in the middle of an afternoon meeting, um, Ashley on staff, she says, oh, I just remembered there's a tent that uh, some people, they tried to give to us a couple of years ago. It's been sitting in storage. It's brand new. It was used one time and they, they'd like to get rid of it. Do you have any use for it? I couldn't believe just the idea that here in the morning, I was like, ah, I'm sorry. I just don't think I have time to kind of bring this up and try to arrange some kind of canopy tent for you. And yet God was in control and he had already planned this. In fact, this family was excited to not only donate it, but empty out the storage unit that it was stored in so they could close that thing down. And, and I will tell you, with, by Tuesday, we loaded in the truck. And on Thursday, we headed on down to Mexico. And later in that week, we, uh, we gave this to, to Pastor Daniel, and, and he wanted you to, to know that he's grateful. But he also wanted to say, thanks be to God. God, you are in control. And, and when I thought for sure there was no way I had time to, to put together a tent, God had another plan. And he held that tent for a couple of years, I believe, for this moment. What a powerful God we have. We just celebrate his faithfulness. Next one I want to bring you into a, a kind of up-to-date on is a well project. Now, I know that many of you uh, last Christmas, as part of a Christmas offering, you invested in a well in Africa. And because we're also watching this online, I can't get into the details of location. But I can tell you that we're in a holding pattern. One of the hardest things about doing missions at Global Missions and locally discipling people is patience. It's hard when, when you trust God to be in control. Sometimes we want to push things. 
And I want you to know that that money that you have donated is still in our possession. We're holding on to that. We're waiting for the moment. But there's a bit of a, uh, a blockade right now to make this well project happen. And I want to continually update you. And as soon as I have more information to say, hey, now we know when, now we know where, and now we know what we need to do to help, uh, then we'll step into the next piece of this, this awesome opportunity. But, but don't forget and don't lose heart. You see, if we're in control, we're going to push hard and we're going to put wells and do things where perhaps God was not intending or wasn't his best. And I'm trusting that, that God is in control of this well project. Uh, if for some reason we get to a place where we have to reallocate these funds for a different mission project, you'll all be invited into a conversation and we'll pray to seek God's leading. But we believe the well project will be accomplished. The timeline, however, I don't know. I'm going to remember that God's in control. It'll help me and help you as well. The next thing I want to share with you is uh, I want to highlight really some people, but more importantly, I want to highlight what God is doing through people. When I talk about serving in Mexico on a mission trip with the, the church, those are kind of church-organized opportunities. But see, God calls us to serve Him in lots of ways, and I want to celebrate some people today with you and bring you up to speed just a few names, and as I said earlier, if you want to write some things down, I may share something that you're very interested in, and I want you to hear the name. You can reach out to me anytime after this message. You can email me, uh, and I would encourage you, if you feel drawn to something that you'd like to find out more about, let me help you get connected. So let's celebrate a few more things of what, what God is doing. So I'm going to point to a couple pictures, and then you hopefully you can see those on the bigger screen. But let's start in the upper left-hand corner here. This is a picture of Renee Kripe at the ARC campus. And Renee has served in Cuba before, but she just got back with one of our missionaries, Amy Fuller. And when they went to serve, she told me that, you know, you have to get a religious visa, but the government told them very specifically that you may not go into the elderly homes that you would like to go see. I'm sure there's some perhaps control reasons for that. They don't want people to see the living conditions. And I've been there, and I know that they are very difficult. And I know that COVID uh, increased the difficulty of life in Cuba. But I wanted to share something that I believe is evidence that as she went with the thought, hey, we're going to go in and we're going we're gonna to work inside these elderly folks' home and encourage them and pray for them, God had a different plan and uh, Renee celebrates that plan. I'm just going to read a couple things to you. It says, so rather than being able to go into to do these uh, visits in these homes, um, we actually found out there was a very important part of God's plan. Um, instead of those seniors, we were asked if we would help at a three-day conference of about 75 visiting pastors from other churches in Cuba. The kitchen staff was busy, so all of us who were there were asked if we would help to set up and wash and, and dry dishes. Uh, that's not what she thought God had planned for her in Cuba. So she spent time washing dishes, and she wants me to tell you there was about 75 people, but only enough place settings for 40 people. So the rotation of dishes, the rotation of food was a constant process of three meals a day. And she just celebrates that God used her in a way that she did not anticipate. And we don't know the full extent of how that will benefit and expand the kingdom of God, but I believe that it's those moments where we're in surrender that we find ourselves in worship, and we're reminded that God is in control. So I want to thank you, Renee, for going and serve, and there are opportunities at times to do other places uh, to serve like Cuba. And so here's another picture I'll point to a uh, upper right-hand corner. So this is uh, taken at a dump in uh, Tijuana, Mexico. And I want to tell you, this is Ron and Dee Chapel who took this picture. They serve there on their own. They go down a couple times a year sometimes. And this is a, a ministry called, uh, let's see, this one was, oh, I just lost the name of it. I'm so sorry. No, nope, I got it. To Mexico with Love. There we go. Uh, this was a ministry to Mexico with Love. And uh, what they do is they go down and they, they minister to, they share the gospel with, they meet with people in the orphanages. Uh, in the area, in some elderly uh, facilities in the area, and also in the dump regions where many people actually live and call their home. And so they do food ministry, prayer ministry, and then gospel sharing. Uh, this is something that, again, 
It's something that they feel called to. And I just want to celebrate that as God has called them, they've faithfully stepped into those opportunities to serve. Next, I want to kind of bring you over here to the lower right-hand corner. That's Heather Arnsmeyer. And Heather, she just got back from a medical uh, ministry opportunity with an organization called Hands of Hope. Uh, she was in Lima, Peru, and I've seen Heather go off to several other areas to serve in the last several years. But as I've watched, I've served with Heather as well on a medical trip down into Mexico, but I've watched how she has taken vacation time and taking a calling that God has put in her life to go and love people through medical ministry and partnering with people who are proclaiming the gospel and giving opportunities to see people healed, to see people come to faith, and it's just an opportunity where you say, wow, God, you can use my skills as a, a medical worker for your advancement of the kingdom. And I want to finish up with one more, and this is the, the lower left-hand corner here, a picture in Africa. And this picture comes from a place called Doma, Zimbabwe at Eden Children's Village. And so um, we have some people here, John and Jan Silva, who have been going there on their own and investing months at a time to go and partner with this orphanage. And this orphanage houses around 186 children. They have a 350-acre farmland that they use to feed 800 people a day. There's some 45 teens who are being discipled in a discipleship program to continue to proclaim the gospel. And they have been called to do this. It's something that they do. They serve here locally. They work here locally. And when they have time and when they can get there, they head off on their own as God's leading. And I just want to celebrate that God is in control of these things. I want to encourage you, if you feel led, and I know there's some of you who are saying, wait, you know that I went here. I might have forgot somebody. That's not intentional. I'm sorry if I did. But I want you to know that as God leads you, I want to open up the doors of possibility. You don't need to wait for a once-a-year trip to go to Mexico with Family Church. God is at work. He's in control 24-7, 365 days a year. He would love to take you somewhere and would love for you to respond to his call. Another thing I want to celebrate is a perspectives class. And although it's a class to learn more, I want to read a quote from someone in this class. And uh, this took place over 15 weeks. And it's an opportunity to learn more about God's global purpose. And they said that this perspective on the World Christian Movement course was a journey of growing in our understanding and appreciation of the diverse cultures of the world and seeing the amazing work God is doing throughout the world. And I celebrate this because not necessarily that they just completed a class, but I believe that I have watched, I've experienced, and seen how God moves in the hearts of those who've attended these classes. Um, this is also a partnering of multiple area churches who've come together and, and partner together for the advancement of the gospel, sometimes locally. And then also there's networking that begins to happen to reach globally. And so we just celebrate the completion of that and for those who participated and those who helped to lead that class. Well, I want to take you to a next phase. So we've said that God is in control, but now I want to take you into an amazing story about how God is faithful. And although control and faithfulness go hand in hand, I want to celebrate a couple with you today. A family that has served in almost <laughs> as long as I've been alive in one focused area, and it just amazes me. So I'm 51 years old, and I want to bring to your attention Chuck and Sally Keller. Now, Chuck and Sally Keller, they are, to me, models of faithfulness and God's faithfulness in them. They, Chuck was in the Vietnam War and was injured in combat. And Chuck still felt called, and he and his wife called to return to Southeast Asia, ultimately finding themselves in 1973 uh, in Cambodia. And from there began a journey where God would call them into the translation work of the Krung people. Now, for those who are new to Family Church, we've been uh, a part of the Krung movement of seeing them come to faith, seeing that people group reached since 2006. So we've been partnering for a long time. And May 31st, just a few days ago, Chuck and Sally Keller officially retired from ministry. 50 years, 50 years 
of faithful ministry. And I want to have you listen to an incredible just few minutes as Chuck wants to say thank you and share his story with you. So here's Chuck. Hello, uh, I'm Chuck Keller. My wife Sally and I have served in Cambodia for many years. Uh, first going there in the 1970s, and we had an initial contact with Krung people in that time. Couldn't do very much, so we had to leave the country. But then able to work on the project by sponsoring refugees and by working in refugee camps in the 80s. And then uh, we had family complications with our, our youngest son who's with the Lord now, had a brain tumor, and that slowed us down quite a bit. But he actually was able to come with us to Cambodia several times. I think he saw, observed six birthdays with us on our times in Cambodia. Um, so we've worked on various things with Wycliffe over the years. We're approaching retirement. In fact, on the 31st, that's my our official first day of retirement. Uh, we uh, it felt with the low issues of health and age, it was best to retire at this time. But uh, we're encouraged by what's been happening in the Krung translation. Uh, we were able to do uh, a lot working with our good uh, Krung speaker, Padu, and others in the committee there of the local believers. And uh, we got to um, almost all the New Testament consultant check uh, with my involvement on that. Uh, but this year, now with Brian Kane working with EMU, who's learned the language so well, uh, he's been able to help us with community checking and now even the checking of the last New Testament book needing checking. That's the book of Hebrews. And uh, that has just been done uh, this month. And uh, so that sort of clears a path for the printing of the Chrome New Testament. We hope that it will be uh, even can be done this year. And that'll be a wonderful thing for the people to have. Uh, thank you for, for uh, Brian's expertise with the software and all of those things. It's just good to have a younger person. <laughs> In fact, most people I know are younger. <laughs> but anyway, uh, just thankful too. You've supported this project for so many years now, and it's been a wonderful thing that we could just count on that month by month, and it uh, provided uh, funds for our uh, for Purdue for his salary, plus some of the committee meetings. And it's just been a great help, and we appreciate the way you've come out to visit. Some of your members have come out to visit the project and, and other things going on in northeastern Cambodia. So we're just thankful for that involvement. So just to, to say thank you and uh, I pray that the New Testament can get printed this year. And you can just pray for Sally and me with our health needs too. Thank you. Chuck and Sally Keller. Can you imagine what's the legacy that they've left? The legacy that follows Chuck and Sally is the potential for many, many years to follow of people who will read the work that they were a part of in translating God's word into the Krung language. And many will come to faith as a result of their faithfulness. So they have been faithful and God has been faithful as well. And I want to do something a little different at our campuses and at our sites. I'm going to give you about 40 seconds. I'm just going to ask that you would take, no one's going to come up on the stage. Just right now, we're going to pause. I'm going to keep the picture up for you. I just would like you to engage in a moment of prayer, a moment to say, thank you, God, to celebrate, a moment to pray over their health as as um, Sally has had some kind of dementia type things going on as well as for the translation work. Pray that you would uh, pray for this completion for this year. We'll talk more about that in a little while. So I'm just going to give you a moment. Let's lift them up in prayer.
All right. So you're watching online, and I want to just let you know that I had to release to our online, or to, excuse me, to our campuses, and uh, as, as they are going through now a little bit more that I can't share with you today, unfortunately. I think that's one of the, the hard elements of, of having a message that I can't share all the details. In fact, at our campuses right now, we're going to talk through some very uh, essential prayer needs. And some of them uh, are involved with people that I can't use their names. I can't talk about locations. Uh, we work in places where lives are at stake. And we want the gospel to go out. And we don't want to fear persecution. We don't want to fear what could happen as we share the gospel. But we definitely don't want to ever be a church that puts our missionaries in a dangerous position uh, because we want to celebrate out loud or we want to ask for out loud prayer. So all I can do today is give you a couple of just generalizations of what I'm referring to. And I would encourage you, if you want to reach out, you certainly can email me if you'd like to know more. I'd love to hear from you. But I also want you to know that this, this part is a really critical piece of our journey together. As we follow God, as we desire to lead the nations uh, to Christ, that it requires your faithful giving. And many of you have been very generous. We want to say thank you. Because reaching the croon has required years of faithful giving and prayer. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about the fact that the, the Kroon translation is being completed this year. It's on track to be done by November, and that is the prayer. So just want to lift that up to you and pray over the aspects of that translation, the, the printing process, the final editing, um, that you would protect those who are part of this journey, a part of this work. Second is we're going to talk about some of our African missionaries that I, again, I can't mention by name, but um, we have a particular set of missionaries that are going through a very difficult season. They have some leadership challenges, and where they feel they're being called, the leadership is trying to hold them back from. And so I'm just going to ask you, you may not know their names, you may not know who I'm talking about, but I'm just going to encourage you to consider praying for our African missionaries. And God knows who you're praying for, but would you pray for rest as they've had to step away from their area of ministry? Would you also pray for wisdom? And specifically, would you pray for the leadership's surrender to God's will, not maybe their own personal will? Just ask you to do that on your time. Um, and also a reminder that we have a, an African missionary uh, that may be coming back uh, here to visit us. And so I want to invite you into that. Also, I want to give you a couple of other thoughts as I close. Um, many times we have missionaries that they come to the end of their season, just like the Kellers. And sometimes we have missionaries that, that transition from one ministry position into another ministry position or one ministry organization into another. And I'd like you to know that we have two of our missionaries, another one who's in Africa that is uh, being led to go serve somewhere else. And we have a, a set of missionaries that have been serving in Mexico for some time. And they're transitioning from one ministry into a different ministry altogether. I just want you to know that at Family Church, we really feel led to reach the unreached. What that means, if you're not familiar with that, it means when we look around the globe, we see unique people groups with unique languages and cultures that don't have the Bible, they don't have, they don't have pastors, they don't have videos, they don't have teachings, they don't have churches to gather or house churches. They have basically nothing. They don't have the gospel yet. That's the essence what an unreached group is. And we feel that that's our call as family churches to, to really invest your finances, your giving into reaching those who don't have anything like what we have in terms of our spiritual ability to grow. And so we have some missionaries that are making a transition into a new mission agency that isn't necessarily what we feel is bad. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, if you know who I'm talking about, because you've been doing this for a long time, um, I would encourage you to pray and continue to support them. But organizationally, we have to say goodbye. We have to part ways. We don't feel like following them with, with the finances is what God's called us to. And we love them. We've had a good talk with them. I just want you to know, that's part of the challenge of leading is, is taking that step forward and trusting God because, well, he is faithful. And the last thing I'll close with is um, in Cambodia specifically, I just want you to know that as the gospel is going out, we are seeing the transforming work of God. And, and I want you to understand something. Those that we are trying to reach in Cambodia, 
they come out of spirit worship. They, they focus their lives before the gospel came in lives of fear. Fear that when someone dies, they may not leave the area and they'll come back and torment them because they didn't perform a, a funeral the right way. They didn't build the casket the right way. They, they didn't put pig's blood and other animal sacrifices in the correct order or did them the right way or, or they bur- buried them of all things on an even day, not an odd day. They lived under fear. And when the gospel came, they found hope. They found hope in Christ. And I, I hope that as you have listened to the message today, as, as you've probably been encouraged and inspired, that you understand that everything we're talking about, about God's being in control, about God's faithfulness, is that God desires that all would hear. He would love that all would come to him. And we want to be a part of presenting the gospel to those who've never yet heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And if that's you today, if you've not yet received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you, nothing else, grab God's word, go get a Bible, begin to read his word and let him search your heart. And I pray that you would take this time to really reflect on that. So I want to take you into a passage here. I'm going to kind of end where we started. I'm going to get you back. Let's go back to Psalm 96. I want to use this as a platform for our setting up of communion. I want to take what you've heard, but I want to apply it to communion today. I want you to to think about what does this mean when we say, sing to the Lord a new song? Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, and tell of his salvation day to day. One of the reasons that Jesus said, when you eat this bread, when you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And today I want you to to use this as a time to sing of God's marvelous works, to remind yourself that it was by his blood that you were healed. It was by his sacrifice that you could find hope and a future. And uh, as we eat and drink, we also are called to do some personal time with God, to reflect, to remember, to ask again, God, forgive me for this. I know you do, but I want to repent of where I have been led astray. And if there are things that you need to present to God before we eat and drink, I want to encourage you to take this time. And I'm going to give you some music, give you a chance to to think and to pray. And then I'll come back and I'd like to eat and drink together kind of as as one one body today. So here's just a few moments. Please take this to reflect and remember the amazing work that Jesus has done, his salvation. Let's speak of it for day to day. If you need more time, by all means, please take the time that you need. In fact, I encourage you, if there's something that you know is unresolved, that that maybe there's some sin that you just have not dealt with, you haven't confessed, you haven't gone and apologized, or maybe you haven't forgiven, before you eat and drink, I would encourage you to make a phone call to to reach out to those that may need that. But, But together, I'd like to eat and drink together. And I'd like to begin just with prayer with you now. So let's pray together before we eat and drink. Father God, we come to you together as one body, and when we eat and drink, we are declaring, Lord, that you will return, that you are on the throne today, 
that you are in control, that you are faithful and you are glorious. So God, may you be glorified today. May we remember your goodness and may we sing of your salvation from day to day. May each day be an opportunity for us to present truth to those who are far from you and love those who need love. And thank you for your sacrifice. And so today, Lord, we eat and drink to remember you. Help us to never forget. And it's in your name we pray. Let's eat and drink together. Before we say goodbye today, I just want to send you off and encourage you of a few things. One, I'd encourage you to spend some time remembering and celebrating God's marvelous works in your life and to share those with your friends and family. Let this be a time where you begin to reflect and celebrate his marvelous works. And uh, secondly, just want you to know we're about to begin a new series throughout the summer. We're going to walk through Exodus. and We're going to hopefully learn a good foundational truth about who our God is. So we've called this, This is Our God. I encourage you to join us each week. And if you can get into one of our campuses, I would strongly encourage you to do that as a chance to gather together. Thank you guys for joining me today.